phone and text Melissa if they can hear us. Okay, good. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. Carruthers, we're here at OSS Hospital in our, our beautiful operating room. Uh, we've got a great presentation here for you tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about robotic assisted knee and hip replacement surgery, something that all of us are very uh, excited um, and, and happy to share with you here tonight. Um, I'm Dr. Carruthers, Dr. Corey Carruthers. I'm joined here by Dr. Marquez uh, and Dr. Jackson. Uh, we're going to be doing this presentation together. It's the very first time we've done anything like this, this live webinar. Uh, we've done some other talks in the past. They've always been live here in COVID times. So we got a, we got a new format for you. We've got something um, a little bit different. We're actually going to give you a demonstration about how this robot works uh, and why we like it. We're going to give you a talk about uh, arthritis uh, and the treatment options for it. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about surgery and actually show you how we do some of these things. Uh, we've got some extra uh, special guests here tonight. We've got our two Mako robots here in the room. We've got the voice of Stryker here helping us tonight. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started and get rolling. So, um, again, I'm Dr. Corey Carruthers. I've been here at uh, OSS for a couple of years now, specialized in uh, robotic hip and knee surgery. We've been doing this for a few years. Uh, I'm a local boy, grew up here in, in Lancaster, uh, which is Franklin Marshall College. Um, went to med school down in Philly, Philadelphia College of Boston Path of Medicine. Came back to New York to do some of my work with the surgery training. Um, then I actually spent one year doing some subspecialty training in hip and knee replacement surgery uh, at the Ford Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, now I'm back here doing robotic hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, Introduce some of these other guys here. We've got a uh, pass off to Dr. Jackson, and I'm going to go get the presentation set up and ready to roll. Hi, guys. Again, thanks for uh, viewing this uh, presentation. We're pretty excited about robotic uh, knee replacement here in uh, South Central Pennsylvania. Again, I'm Eric Jackson. I come from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of the Eight Nose Steelers. Um, I went to Penn State University, uh, and then I went down to Virginia Tech for medical school. Uh, again, I did my uh, residency training in orthopedics here locally at Wellspan. Uh, then I went to University of Buffalo where I did a year of specialty training in uh, hip and knee replacement and where we uh, started using the robotic um, technology. Again, I've been here for just over two years as well. Um, thanks again for joining. And I'll pass it off to Dr. Morganis. Hello all, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this uh, Zoom conference. Please bear with us for any technical glitches. Uh, again, Dr. Morganis, a uh, local boy here from New York. I've uh, been here now in practice for six years, uh, trained locally as well from Memorial and York Hospital, uh, did my residency here and uh, medical school in Philadelphia, did my joint fellowship down in Baltimore. Uh, a little unique compared to the other guys, when I first started my practice, I was doing these the traditional way for about three and a half to four years. We've had these robots here for going on almost two years now. Um, I when I first started, I was weaning myself into it, and now I'm 100% robotic uh, knee replacement surgery. It's been a game changer. Uh, the patients are noticing huge differences uh, in their results and outcomes. Um, I think it's a uh, the only way to do any replacement, and we're here to show you tonight why and uh, how it works. A uh, couple of uh, little notes, please, for everyone. Any questions, please put them in the Q and A box, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. For those of you that have submitted uh, questions to Melissa by email, please also put them again in the Q and A box to make sure that we have them. And for everyone out there, uh, we have access, uh, control to mute you, but please put all your computers on mute. That way we can uh, share our screens and you can see what we're, we're doing. Uh, from here, I'm going to uh, go back to Dr. Carruthers. Uh, Dr. Carruthers and Dr. Jackson are gonna take us through the presentation and then we'll come back to the OR and I'll show you how these robots do a, a perfect knee for you. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Margatis. Here, I'm gonna get our presentation up and rolling and share the screen with you guys.
All right, guys, here we go. Everybody got me? Perfect. All right, so again, our talk tonight is about robotic joint replacement surgery. Uh, we're gonna talk about hip and knee arthritis. We're gonna talk about robotic assisted, uh, mostly knee replacement surgery here today on our, uh, our presentation. Um, but I will also let everyone know that we are doing uh, robotic assisted hip replacement surgeries as well. Oh, here we go. All right. I'm I'm sharing the screen, but he needs to stop. All right, here we go. All right, sorry guys, bear with us here. Like, yeah, sorry, ever time. Yeah, go ahead. It's the first time that we've done anything like this, but again, here we go. We'll we'll get started. I'm Dr. Carruthers. Uh, I'm going to be talking about robotic joint replacement surgery tonight. Does I'm screen sharing. All right, here we go. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We'll get this thing rolling here. All right, got us. Perfect. Here we go. Um, so thanks for bearing with us, guys. Thanks for having some patience. Like I said, it's the first time that we've, we've done this. Um, you know, I'm going to get the presentation started here. Again, I'm Dr. Carruthers. We're going to talk about robotic um, assisted um, knee and hip replacement surgery here tonight. Um, I'm going to run through this presentation again. I introduced myself already. This is just a little bit about myself and my bio. Um, same thing here with Dr. Jackson. He's introduced himself already. Um, and also Dr. Mark Gaddis. So just a little bit about us here at OSS. Um, so we're uh, actually a physician-owned hospital. We have a lot of York and, and Lancaster Central PA natives here. Um, we have about 20 orthopedic surgeons now. We have a bunch of different subspecialists, uh, podiatrists, sports medicine um, specialists, uh, a couple of different pain management providers, um, and also rheumatologists. Um, we have lots of convenient uh, offices for you guys to get to, York, Hanover, Mechanicsburg, Gettysburg, um, and also a podiatry office um, in Columbia. Um, so just a little bit about us. We, we have a lot of different awards that we seem to win each year. Um, you know, we're proud of a lot of that. We've got a big trophy case outside displaying a lot of uh, you know, these awards. Uh, we take a lot of uh, great pride in, in, in our, um, in our uh, patient experience and, uh, and how we treat patients and, and get a lot of uh, recognition because of that. So our talk tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about um, arthritis, uh, particularly knee arthritis, what the treatment options are for this. And then we're going to talk about surgery. And we're actually going to give you a, a little demonstration tonight about how this uh, robotic assisted um, surgery works and why we, we like it and why we think it's better. So your joints, your joints are involved in almost every activity you do. Um, if you're having pain in your joints, it can, can cause a lot of discomfort and cause you a lot of problems with your activities of daily living. Um, particularly knee and, and uh, hip or plate, excuse me, particularly hip and knee pain, cause you a lot of difficulty uh, getting around or doing the things that you want to do. Um, so osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is uh, something we treat as orthopedic surgeons quite a bit. So osteoarthritis is the most common type of arthritis. It's degenerative arthritis. Um, so all the joints in your body are covered by, it's called articular cartilage. 
over time that articular cartilage can start to wear down and wear out. And that's what osteoarthritis is. Now I tend to describe this to patients like the cartilage in your joints is like the uh, tread on the tires on a car. You drive your car around and you wear the tread down. The same thing happens with the cartilage in your joints. And when that cartilage starts to break down and wear out, the problem is that it exposes the bones that are underneath. And when the, the bones get exposed and they rub together, it causes pain, swelling, and inflammation. And obviously that's something that we need to treat and make better. So this is just a little bit overview, particularly of the knee joint. Uh, the knee joint is actually the largest joint in the body. It's often referred to as a hinge joint, but it's a little bit more complex than that. Now it does flex and extend, but it has a lot of other movements to it. It can rotate, it can translate, it can twist. So there's a lot of different um, movements that it can do that, that we have to take into account um, as surgeons. So this is just an overview of what a knee would look like. So you can see this top bone on the top, that's the femur, that's the large bone that sits on top of the tibia. And then you have the kneecap in the front. This creates um, three different compartments in the knee. So on the inside, medial compartment, the outside lateral compartment, and then the, the kneecap is the third compartment. This is what a, a knee replacement, or excuse me, what a, a knee joint looks like. Now, why does my knee hurt? We start to talk a little bit about arthritis already. If you look at the, uh, the picture here on the left, this is what a healthy knee looks like. If you look at the white stuff here, that's now nice, healthy looking cartilage. Over time, that cartilage can start to wear down and wear out. And it looks like the, uh, the picture here more on your right. When that cartilage isn't there and it exposes the bone, it causes a lot of pain, swelling, uh, and inflammation. Now, one of the first things that happens if you come in to see me in the clinic, uh, one of the first things we're gonna do uh, to check out uh, your knee, if that's what we're looking at, is, to do, is will be to do some x-rays. So if you look on the left side, this is what a more normal looking knee x-ray would look like. If you look in between the two bones, see how there's a lot of space? That's that cartilage space that we talked about. Now, when that cartilage starts to wear out, you start to get an x-ray that looks more like the, the screen, or the, the picture on the right. If you look on the inside part of this knee, how the bones are very, very close to each other. You hear people say bone on bone arthritis. That's what this is what, uh, that's what this would look like on an x-ray. This is uh, an arthritic knee. Now there's a lot of different things that we do to help manage arthritis. Not everything is surgical. Before you ever talk about doing a surgery, there's a lot of different things that we can do to help manage your symptoms or manage your pain. And that's part of our job is to help you manage symptoms. Now, when you have cartilage wear or arthritis, will cartilage ever come back? No, of course it won't, but we can certainly help manage the symptoms that you have. Now, what are the things that we do to help manage arthritis? First of all, medications. There's a lot of different medications that we do. Uh, the things that most patients will do to start with this is over-the-counter medications, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, things like NSAIDs. These are Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen, also Tylenol. Tylenol is something that people can do as well. There are prescription anti-inflammatories that we will send sometimes, things like Meloxicam, Celebrex, Diclofenac. These are prescription NSAIDs that we'll send. Um, there's also topical NSAIDs, things like Voltaren gel that can also be very useful. Um, other things that we'll always talk to patients about, exercise. Exercise is very important in any type of arthritic joint. Um, there have been studies that show that people that even have arthritis, it can help the health of the cartilage and help their overall mobility and functionality by continuing to do low impact exercises, things like walking, um, a bike, an elliptical, swimming, all of these things are great low impact activities that can help you maintain range of motion, muscle strength and function, even though you have some arthritic changes. Um, physical therapy is something that we'll also do sometimes to help with overall functionality. Um, other things, braces, there are certain types of braces that we will use sometimes. The big braces that we use for arthritis tend to be what we call unloader braces or offloading braces. They help to push your knee in a certain way to help take the, um, the stress off the arthritic part of the knee. Um, walkers, canes, other assisted devices can also help. Um, and then one of the other things that we do are injections. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about um, the different types of injections that we do for arthritis. The first is what people tend to call uh, cortisone injections. These are steroid injections. Uh, steroid injections are 
powerful anti-inflammatories. They go inside the joint. They help decrease pain. They help decrease swelling and inflammation. Um, steroid injections are things that we can do um, every three or four months. We tend to not do them any more often than that. Um, there's also a different type of injection that a lot of us will do called visco supplementation. Um, a lot of people refer to these as gel injections or, uh, or the chicken shot or the rooster shot. Um, these are made of a protein called hyaluronic acid. So basically what hyaluronic acid is, is a, a buffer for a lubricant. I describe it to patients as this is almost like an oiling procedure, like a WD-40. You're introducing a lubricant into the inside of the knee to help the knee um, slide, help it glide a little bit better. Uh, and, and in turn, this helps decrease pain, swelling, and inflammation. This is something that we do quite a bit as well. Um, these are a lot of the conservative measures that we do to help treat arthritis. Um, you know, ultimately, you fix cartilage wear and you fix cartilage damage with a surgery. Okay? And what the surgery is, is a resurfacing surgery. What you're doing is taking out damaged bone and cartilage and you're replacing it with metal and plastic parts. You're changing the bearing surface. Okay? And there's a couple different ways that we do this. Um, you know, we talk about partial knee replacement. This is something that many of you may have heard of. Partial knee replacement um, involves only resurfacing a part of the joint, only the part that's damaged. Um, and this is an option in, in many patients. And um, this is certainly something that, that many of us are willing to talk to you about. Um, then the other option is called full knee replacement or total knee replacement. And total knee replacement, you're resurfacing the entire joint. Um, and there are certain risks and benefits to both partial and total knee replacements that, that any of us would certainly be happy to talk to you about. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, Mako knee replacements. So again, this is, um, you know, robotic assistance. This is a uh, um, same type of implants that we use, but it, it just helps us to put these implants in a better position. And that's why we all tend to like it. Um, now, I'm just going to go over this brief overview slide. This kind of goes over everything that we've talked about. Most of us have a general algorithm as to how we treat arthritis. Um, this is some of the stuff I talked about already. Usually the first step, um, some oral anti-inflammatory medication, Advil, ibuprofen, uh, prescription anti-inflammatory medications, um, weight loss exercises we talked about, therapy. Um, if patients continue to be symptomatic and continue to have dysfunction, then we start to move down to the next step. Um, the next step is the injections that we talked about. Again, there's a couple different injections that we can do to help manage symptoms, the steroids, and also the visco supplementation, um, the gel injections. These are things like Synvisc, uh, Uflexa, um, braces we talked about. Um, and then if patients continue to be symptomatic after that, that's when we start talking about surgery. Again, the surgery for arthritis of the knee, partial or total knee replacement. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand this presentation off to Dr. Jackson now. He's going to start talking to you a little bit about surgery, uh, the types of different surgery. Um, we're going to start talking to you a little bit about, uh, about the robot. Hi, everyone. Again, thanks for uh, sticking with us here. So I'm going to touch base on when we should consider to do joint replacement surgery. After you've failed all the non-operative management that Dr. Carruthers was talking about, that's when it's uh, time to start considering joint replacement. What I tell my folks is ask yourself a couple questions. How bad is my pain? How long can I live with it? If it's bad, you can live with it, certainly live with it. But if you're starting to avoid the things that you want to do, if you're not going to the Hershey Park, if you're not going out and about, that's when it's time to do something about it. So these four general questions, are you having pain getting around? Are you avoiding things? Are you not getting a good night's sleep? Uh, are you having trouble going upstairs? These are all um, reasons why uh, one would consider um, having their joint replaced. Again, just to kind of show a schematic of what the uh, difference between a partial and a total joint replacement looks like. Again, like Dr. Crothers alluded to, uh, knee replacement surgery is kind of like a mis uh, misleading statement. It's really a resurfacing procedure. Uh, again, we're replacing the cartilage with metal and plastic parts. So in the image uh, on the left of the screen, it shows that this is a partial knee replacement, replacing the inside portion of the knee only. Uh, the rest of the knee is uh, not uh, affected by arthritis, so you can um, just replace one part of it. Now, the advantage that here is that folks with partial knee replacements feel like it's a more natural knee. The reason why is because we don't have to take out some of the ligaments in the middle of the knee 
that everyone with a total knee replacement has removed. Again, the downside of a partial knee replacement at some point, there may be a time when you have to you develop arthritis in the other two compartments and you have to be converted to a total knee replacement. Now, people often ask how long that is. Um, and there's been some good data out of the Australian registry showing that a partial knee replacement performed with Mako assistant surgery has a higher survivorship than all other uh, companies' partial knee replacements um, on the market. So we're hopeful that this will give you at least 10 to 15 years um, worth of relief um, and maybe even longer, we don't know yet. Um, if someone has more parts of their joint uh, affected by arthritis, well then they move forward with a total knee replacement, which is basically again, resurfacing of all parts of the knees, the inside, outside, and the behind the kneecap with metal and plastic parts. So we'll show a little video of where we started from, where we came from. So during the surgery, the patient's positioned and like every surgery, uh, every surgery you have an incision on the front of the knee that exposes uh, the knee uh, so you can perform the surgery. Often people ask me, are your uh, incisions smaller? My incision's about the same size as it used to be, but now with robotics, you can make it, um, it's less dissection deep. And then traditionally you would put these um, blocks and jigs on the bone and then cut the bone with a freehand saw. And the, the, how we decide where these blocks go is determined by the canal of the femur bone, which you'll see in the next slide. Again, these, this is uh, the best we had at the time. You know, when knee replacements were um, first developed in the 60s and 70s, this is the best that they had. So, you know, it, it got by and made and had a good result, but can we do things better? And that's what we're striving to do. We're trying to do things a little bit better. Again, this shows you how these jigs are, are placed. You have on the picture on your left is a picture of the, of the femur where you put a rod that goes all the way down the tube of the femur and then you connect these jigs and we have a predetermined um, place to cut um, based on uh, not an individual's anatomy, but what's the standard of everyone's anatomy. So each person gets the same kind of bone preparation. Again, the picture on the, on the right demonstrates the saw going through one of these jigs. And if anyone's used a, uh, a saw before, whenever you're cutting hard wood, the blade can deflect. And again, that's another thing that can happen. So it's an inexact science when we're using these jigs. And part of this inexact science may lead to dissatisfaction after total knee replacements. Now, total knee replacements, tradition and literature show that there's a five to 20% of the folks that have these surgeries aren't completely happy with their joint. Now, when we, when we Compare that to total hip replacements, hip replacements have a much higher satisfaction rate. So we ask ourselves, why are knees painful? Or, or why are we unsatisfied? And it's because of pain, it's because of stiffness. Sometimes you can have instability. And what that means is if the knee, the ligaments on the side of the knee aren't, aren't tensioned appropriately, which will lead to the knee feeling wobbly. This ultimately leads to poor function. Um, and then you know, five and a half percent of folks complain that they're worse than they were before surgery. And obviously surgeons don't like to hear that. And so we're trying to figure out, is there a better way to do this? This dissatisfaction can be caused by component malpositioning. You can see, you don't have to be a surgeon to see uh, the picture on the top in A, there's a big bow to that, to that x-ray. There's a lot of space in between the, the bright metal parts and that's all plastic parts. And you can see it just doesn't look right. When you look at the picture on the bottom, that's the front view and the side view of one of our patients that had a robotic hip replace, uh, robotic knee replacement. And obviously you can see there's a stark difference in how the components look in the knee. So uh, the future is here and the future has been here. We've been doing robotic um, knee replacements here in central PA uh, since the end of December or end of uh, 2018. We started with one robot and now we have three in town um, so, you know, we're not going to keep doing the archaic way of doing things that worked back in the 60s and 70s when we have something better. So, like you saw the robots in the, in the operating room, it's called a Mako robotic assisted uh, total knee replacement. The advantage here is it's a personalized procedure. Everything we do is for that individual's knee. And those of us who do the both knees at the same time realize that 
not both knees are treated the same, even in the same patient. So what does the patient have to do before surgery? The one difference between the conventional way and the robotic way is you have to get a CT scan. And what I tell folks is this marries the bones in your knee to the robot and allows us to use the software to uh, achieve that personalized um, treatment for, for the individual patient. What a CT scan is, is it's a bunch of images that, that construct a three-dimensional um, reconstruction of your knee bone, knee, knee bones. You can see here the, the CT scan on the left is, is the, the hard copy, and then it makes the 3D model on the right. And at the top, that's the 3D copy of a total knee replacement with the thigh bone being on the top and the uh, lower leg bone being on the bottom. The green is the perceive is the parts that we are going to put into the uh, patient. And all the numbers, all those numbers are things that you guys don't need to worry about, but it allows us to, um, to adjust the, the parts that are green uh, for each individual patient. And the one on the bottom is the same concept, except it's uh, of a partial knee replacement. Again, just to blow up the total knee replacement on the very left of, uh, of the screen, that's the looking at your knee from the front. Uh, in the middle, you're looking at the knee from the uh, from the bottom and then from the top and then from the side. And all those numbers allow us to change these parts in half a degrees and millimeter, half a millimeter. So our precision and accuracy is unmatched. If you refer back to those clinky um, jigs, we weren't able to do what we can do with the amount of accuracy because we can move in half a degrees with this, um, with this technology. So what is the MAKO? So we have the software allows us to personalize our treatment for each patient. And then it goes to the actual machine itself. So it's a robotic arm that has a saw connected to it. Yes, the surgeon holds, has to control the saw or the burr at all times, but it, it's, there's no cumbersome jigs. There's no pins that need to be put in. There's no um, rods that need to be put in the, in the canals of the bone. It's, it's a, a very clean uh, instrument. And then again, in the operating room, before we commit the patient to any bone cuts, um, we balance the tissues. And what that means is, is on either, either side of the knees, there's ropes of tissues that allow uh, the knee to function and, and make it so it's not so wobbly. Again, you can see here, there's the numbers 18 and 19. That means there's, that's the distance on, of those ropes of tissue. So it's within one millimeter on either side. And again, we have all degrees of freedom to move these parts to make those numbers perfect. Um, and then we can assess overall limb alignment and we can correct big time deformities. And this allows the patient to have um, an, uh, a surgery that's personalized to their, their knee and their soft tissues. Again, this is kind of what we do in the operating room and Dr. Margettis will kind of show you a little bit on the, on the um, presentation, but we have the ability to dynamically balance the joint. And again, that's balancing those ropes of soft tissue. The, if you look on the bottom left-hand screen, there's a circled uh, area that shows numbers that are all out of whack. What our goal is, is to recreate the anatomy the way the, it was before arthritis. And what we do is try to match those numbers up. And the, the little moves in the middle show us that we can do one degree of varus and three degrees of external rotation and move the one part two millimeters anterior. You don't need to know the fancy terminology that we use, but you can see here that we have the ability to, the ability to adjust things and fine tune them to make the knee perfect. And if you look on the, the um, the screen on the right, you can see it's all 18s across the board. So this surgeon recre recreated the person's anatomy and balanced the tissues out perfectly with these subtle moves and, and you know, made, it, made it personalized to that patient. Once we have the plan and we're happy with the plan and you know, all our, our ligaments are gonna balance out nicely, we move towards the operating part of, of the um, procedure. And so what the robot also allows is because it has the saw arm, it has um, built-in safety profiles that, that does not allow the surgeon to either make the saw go in too deep, make the saw go too shallow, make the saw go outside of the bone where it can cut the soft tissues, the ligaments, and all of the stuff around the knee, which we obviously don't want to do. So it really has added to the safety of the procedure as well as the precision and accuracy. Again, you, you can see here, this is when you're making a virtual bone cut. And again, Dr. Morgettis will show you this in the operating room, but on the screen on your right, the, the gray piece is the actual saw blade and the green is the part that we wanna remove. 
And so virtually we can see where our blade is in space and cut those parts uh, to make it uh, very exact. So why is this such a powerful system? It improves where we put parts. If you refer back to that image where the, the, the knee was really bow-legged, the parts are put in wrong. If the parts are put in wrong, the patient won't have a good outcome. So this allows us to put the parts in perfect every time. It allow, and with that being said, we balance the soft tissues. Um, traditionally, what people would have to do is put the parts in and then cut the soft tissues to, to match the parts. Well, that's like causing the patient a, a tear in one of their ligaments, you know, by just it's a surgical tear. Well, with this technology, we don't have to cut the tissues. We don't have to make it so the tissues lengthen. We, we match each person's tissues the way they are in their body. So that idea gives us a better functioning knee with in turn, hopefully increased longevity of the implant, a quicker recovery, less pain, less narcotics. And we've been doing this now for two years. And I think if you ask any one of us, we've all seen all these things true in our patient population. Again, the, you know, what we're going for here is improved early functional recovery, reduced time in the hospital to discharge, the increased range of motion, less swelling, less pain. And that's what some of the early literature has shown as well. What can you expect after surgery? Um, you're gonna be in the hospital for between one to three nights. Typically partial knees are, can get out a little bit quicker. You're starting to weight bear right away. You're using a walker for a week to two weeks and transition to a cane when you're comfortable. Um, typically you come back and see us in two weeks and, and at which point we uh, check the incision, check your range of motion. Um, you know, we're doing outpatient physical therapy, all of those things. Uh, and then recovery for a partial knee, again, is, is quicker than a total knee. Uh, a safe bet is a, a four to six week recovery for a partial knee and a six to eight week recovery for a total knee, meaning 80% of the recovery is early. You're much better than you are before surgery, but there's still some, some pain and inflammation and swelling that can happen as you become more active. Um, and there's, so there's 20% of recovery that can take a little bit longer to get all the way better. And with that, we're going to switch back over to Dr. Margettis. All right, so I'm going to stop my share. All right, can you guys see me? No. Yeah, we uh, just look up, George. You can see us? No. You, you can't see my content? Uh, flip, flip the flip your screen. Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, there sorry, you go. Perfect. Very good. We got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody, back to the operating room. Good job, guys. Very well said. Very good presentation. Um, what we have here set up is a sawbone. This is an actual knee. Um, this is a left knee. This is actually what we use in surgery. This is the operating table. Um, you see a leg positioner here. This allows us to move the knee to where we need it. The robot sits off here to the side uh, during the surgery. Um, we do remove the robot once all of our bone cuts have been made. All the white that you see here is the actual bone. This is your thigh bone or femur. This is your tibia. This is the actual knee joint. Two uh, pieces of equipment you see here are, are called the arrays. These act as GPS coordinates. They monitor where the knee is in space to allow the robot to find the knee and be able to make the cuts that we're going to uh, input into the program. As many of you already know, we will obtain a CT scan of the knee to get a true representation of your anatomy. The most important part of the procedure though is when we're in surgery, we're going to map your actual knee. We have these probes. Uh, these probes also have some arrays here uh, to input to the robot. Um, what you're going to see here, what you're seeing up on the monitor there is the actual tibia or the actual uh, bottom part of the knee. You'll see a bunch of dots. Before we begin the procedure, what we're going to do is put the point of this probe or this array onto those dots. Once we do all that, then, there, then you will see one, two, three, four, five, six bubbles. These bubbles then confirm 
that our registration was accurate, meaning that your actual anatomy that we found in surgery correlates with the CAT scan. So then we have a true representation of your anatomy. Just to give you an example, I've already registered this tibia. So we'll go down to this bubble here. If you look up to the top right there, it says point four millimeters. So we are pretty spot on of where we were planning to be, and this confirms it. Now, if you look at the screen there, we also do the same thing for our femoral component, for the femoral side, a bunch of different dots, which we have to register, and once again, confirm our registration by popping one of those bubbles, and now we know we have an accurate model of what your knee looks like. It's alignment, any contractures, uh, and what it looks like before we make any cuts. Once we do the registration, it's called, as Dr. Jackson said, dynamic balancing. If you can look up on the screen there, you know, if you look at me real quick, I'm holding the actual knee and I'm able to manipulate the knee in order to know what the actual balance is on the knee. And on the computer screen here, and this is the most important part, is it will tell me like, oh gosh, if you look there, we have a 15 and a 13, a 12. Well, what I'm able to do is I'm able to manipulate that by moving the components uh, as best as we can and make it as, as Eric or that, and we make it 18s. We like that. We're going to accept that. We like the position of that knee in extension. Now, what we could never do on a traditional knee, we are now going to bring this knee into flexion. And we're going to Okay, so now we look here, we're at 20 and 19, not too bad, but we were at 18 as an extension. So we're going to adjust the components and make it 19s there. So we balanced our knee inflection, we balanced our knee extension. We got 18s in extension and 19s in flexion. We're then able to shift our component up and make it 19s the whole way across, for example, in this case. At that point, we've decided that we have the knee balanced. So then we will go to the next screen to see that these actual components fit your bone perfectly. So before we even make one cut, we have not even made a cut yet. And what you're looking at up here on the screen is your actual knee. The green are, is the components. And if you look on the top right corner, it fits you like a glove. We know that if we make this, these cuts, it's not gonna cut into the distal part of the, the bone there and cause what's called a notch or a fracture. Uh, it's perfect symmetry. Uh, following the contour of your actual bone. All right, so what we're, we're going to do now is show you how to do some of the cuts. We're specifically going to try and cut the bottom bone of the tibia. We finished with the blue probe, which was for registration. We now have a green probe. The green probe now makes sure that we have checkpoints. These are uh, areas that, that help us to stay safe. Make sure that all our checkpoints, all our landmarks stay consistent and nothing is shifted. So if you look here, I put this on our little checkpoint there, and the computer says we're good. I then bring the saw blade in, and this is exactly how it happens in surgery. I'm standing on this side, the knee is there in the holder, the saw comes in, and we check the saw blade. Make sure that the saw blade is also where the robot had registered it. These are all checkpoints. These are all mechanisms to prevent error. Once we have passed all those checkpoints to make sure we are safe, to make sure that everything is where we want it to be, at that point, we're ready to make our first cut. So we're gonna screen over to the screen here. Should we come behind me here? So you look in, so you can see everything. So you're gonna be behind me, and this is exactly what you're seeing. I'm holding the saw. The saw is right there, getting ready to make the cut. The yellow shows that I'm in within the boundaries. I'm going to pull the trigger, and it's going to take me to our predetermined coordinate view, our GPS coordinate of the cut that I asked it to do. The green that you see there is the bone we're going to remove. So let's go ahead and make our first cut. And what you're seeing there is the bone go away. All right, nice and controlled. So. Oh, and right there, it stopped. I purposely 
pushed a little harder to show you guys that the robot will not allow me to go beyond those green boundaries. It will stop. Therefore, protecting your vital structures, such as your ligaments and your arteries. That's a checkpoint. So we have to come back out again and start all over if that happens. And once again, it tells me I'm back where we need to be and we, make, we start making our cuts. If you're noticing, if you watch me, I'm not even really looking at the knee. I'm looking up at the, at the monitor to ensure that I'm making these cuts. Meaning, we really trust this robot, it's pretty safe. All right, that's telling me I've made all the cuts, but I see a little bit of green back there. Let's get rid of that green back there as well. All right, and if you see, if you see where it turns, I'm gonna turn that for us. All right, right there, it's starting to turn red, meaning it's saying I'm going out of bounds. All right, so we're pleased with that cut. At that point in time, we then do the same thing for the femur. If you look down here, we went ahead. This is all the bone we're removing. So this is the cut I just made off the tibia. Um, very thin, very little bone. Uh, so it is a bone conserving procedure. Um, and then if you look here, these are the small pieces of bone we remove off the thigh bone. If you look at the bone here, as we show you guys in the clinic, just little cuts. And this is the thickness of the bone that we remove. So it's very little bone that's being removed, just enough to be able to fit our components. So let's see how we did it. We first start by placing our femoral component. And if you look, that's a pretty nice fit. Once we do that, we go ahead and we put the bottom component in place. So come on down this way. With our components in place, we're now going to see how well we did. All right, so if you look there, we're getting a 23 and a 22, which is one millimeter difference, which is pretty darn good. Let's see how we did when we bring it down to a full arc motion, down to about 90 degrees. We had 22s. So out of four quadrants, we have 22s with a 23 in one of them. So it's a millimeter of difference, which is a really good knee. In surgery, we're gonna feel the knee, it goes fully straight. We're then gonna bend it and make sure that it feels right. Make sure your kneecap is tracking where it should be. At this point, this, the uh, robot will be removed. And we're able to feel it, and it feels perfectly balanced. We bring it down into flexion, and it feels wonderful. So that is a customized knee where we're able to modify all the implants based on a solid bone, um, and we're able to customize it to anyone that comes into the operating room. We're able to minimize our bone resections. We're able to safely do the surgery by protecting all the soft tissue, and in the end, we get a balanced knee that is confirmed with objective data that we got an A plus today. I forget anything? That's it. All right, at this point, I'm gonna switch back to the guys. I'm gonna head over and meet them in the boardroom and we'll do some Q and A. Awesome, thank awesome. you, Dr. Margotis. Yeah, so let me share my screen here with you guys and we'll, uh bring up some common questions that, that we get. All right, so here we go. This, this is just a list of common questions that we got. Uh, you guys may be thinking about some of this, but these are some of the questions that we hear quite a bit. So we'll We'll go over some of those and we'll also answer some of the questions that you guys have been putting in the, uh, in the chat. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, now would be a good time to make sure that you put them in the, in the Q&A section at the top and I'll make sure that, that we're checking these here and, and we'll answer them all at the end. But we'll go through some of these common questions that we get about uh, uh, this Mako technology. So first question we get is, is kind of how long has this been around for? Um, so this Mako um, technology actually started as a partial knee replacement um, surgery, and this has been around actually since about 2006. Um, this has kind of evolved from a partial knee platform. They had such great results, we, we turned it into a total knee platform, and we've actually been using it as a total hip platform now as well. So we're doing partial knee replacements, total knee replacements, and, and hip replacements all using this procedure. But about 2006. So this is not like it's something new, but uh, it has become extremely uh, much more popular 
particularly in the last five years or so. Um, some other questions that we get, um, and somebody actually put this in the chat, I think, as well. Can, can any surgeon use this technology? Um, so the answer to that is actually no, not all surgeons can use this. You actually have to go through a training session and make sure that you're able to do it and actually understand it. Um, and then you have to actually go to a course and, and show that you're proficient in doing it. So no, not everybody can do it. And um, I did get a question about whether all the, uh, there we are. <laughs> So no, the, the answer is not everybody can use it. And uh, we did get a question whether all of the, uh, all the surgeons in our group do it. And the answer to that is also no, um, there's only, um, only some of us that are doing it. Let me see if I can mute you. No, I can't mute you, but all right. <laughs> Sorry about the echo guys, we'll, we'll keep going here. All right. Um, and anyway, I'll throw it to one of you guys if you want to answer this one. And my candidate with robotic knee replacement, I'll let Dr. Jackson answer that. So uh, the short answer is everyone's a candidate for uh, robotic knee replacements. I do 100% um, of my primary knees with robotic knee replacements. Um, we even started doing some um, revision or redo surgeries with, ro with robotics, which is kind of a, a newer thing and not a lot of folks are doing it around the country. So we're three of the most advanced in that regard. Um, so the answer is uh, everyone's a candidate, not everyone. Um, and we, all three of us, predominantly every single person does robotics. Is that, isn't that right? You guys are all, everyone gets robotics in your hands. Yeah. You know, another question, is it better than conventional knees? We think it is. I mean, it gives us a personalized surgery. Again, knees come out ever. When I leave the OR, I tell the staff and everyone we did another perfect knee. Um, because every single one is 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 spot on, um, you know. It's we have objective data to prove it. The saw cuts are accurate. The balancing is 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 so precise. Um, so uh, you know, I would uh, echo all of these guys and say, yeah, it's uh, we we believe it's better, and that's why we converted our entire practice to only robotics. Go, you know, I'll start. Oh, Dr. Margas, take a couple here. I guess I'll take this question. Uh, does the Mako robotic arm actually perform the surgery? As you guys actually just saw uh, and witnessed, which I hope it came out nice, it's not performing the surgery. It's actually a tool. It's uh, guiding me to where I asked it to take me. Um, so it's a tool allowing me to do the surgery with more accuracy and precision more than any human can do. This is always a very common question. Uh, does it cost more than a conventional knee replacement? Um, we do not charge for using the robot, uh, robotic knee replacement. Um, there is no additional cost in terms of the actual surgery or cost for the surgeon doing it. However, some insurance companies are not approving uh, the CT scan required, very few. Um, so that is an additional cost at times. I can tell you the three of us have a very few uh, denials or difficulties getting this approved. I honestly made less than 10 in the past two years. However, at OSS, uh, being physician owned in a private uh, orthopedic hospital, we do have a discounted cash price for our patients to be able to get the CAT scan. So that is an option for you to still get the uh, knee, knee replacement robotically. Um, so next question, does using the make robot increase any risk in knee replacement surgery? So, you know, the answer to that is I would tell you probably the exact opposite. I think it decreases some of the risks. Um, you know, it helps you to do a surgery better. It helps you to um, protect what you want to do, protect the ligaments, protect the arteries, protect everything that you want. Now, there are some additional um, pins that you have to place. Um, I've had really no patients that have had any difficulty with any uh, pin site pain, um, infections. There's plenty of literature that suggests there's no um, issues with infections or, or any other problems associated with the robot itself. So I would tell you actually it's probably less risk in my hands. Um, where is this available? So that's, that's a, a good question that we get quite a bit. So we have two robots that you guys saw here at uh, OSS Hospital. Um, and then there's also one uh, more at um, uh, UPMC uh, Pinnacle Memorial. Just to be clear to answer the question on the, on the feed, um, so we have the two that are at OSS Hospital are the Powder Mill Hospital. So that we have two robots at the Powder Mill Hospital to answer the question 
in the chat. Eric, you want to take this one? The uh, question is, is will the uh, Mako increase the longevity of the, of the total knee? We believe so. We think if we put parts in unique to each person, uh, balance the ligaments outright, your knee lasted you at least 50, 60 years. So this one hopefully will last you just as long. Um, you know, time, the jury's still out at this point um, because the, the joints haven't been in long enough. Uh, so, you know, so far we're having good results um, in the five and 10 year data. But, but uh, before we move on to that, let me answer a couple more that were um, on the chat. A question said it uh, was about the demonstration, asking um, why was it 18 on pre-op and 22 in the OR? Um, that's a function of the, um, of the sawbone uh, in the, just the tensioning of the elastic straps on the side. And it's also, we also made the cuts prior. So we had already made the cuts. So when you were seeing the registration at 18, I'd already removed those pieces of bone. So we, we were trying to make it more efficient for the presentation. So that, that's the main reason. But, there for that. I, you know, let me just pose a question to you, you guys. Um, how many times have you had to recut and how many times have you been, you know, drastically off from where you were preoperatively? Or pre pre bone resection rather. Uh, that may be very rare. I can I can I mean, tell you less than one hand. No. Less than five. Yeah, I mean, I think on a very rare occasion, I may have had to recut you know, the bottom bone, the tibia, just to, to give a little bit more space. But uh, again, that's that's very rare on my standpoint. Let, well. let me throw out one more that was on the on the chat. Um, so uh, the question was: Is is there uh, is the patella restored? I'll let each individual talk about it. I'm a, what I consider a selective resurfacer, meaning if it's really arthritic, um, I, I resurface the back side of it and put a, a metal uh, or a plastic button on the back of it. Um, I'll let Corey and uh, George talk about what they do. Yeah, so I'm the same, selectively resurfacing. If it's very arthritic, we'll, we'll resurface it and put a small button on the back. Um, you know, it just depends on what it looks like. There's a lot of literature out there. Um, and there's no good answer. If you look at orthopedic literature, there's there's plenty of um, countries that, around the world that nobody will resurface any patellas. There's some countries that everybody will resurface patella. Um, I think most of us here tend to be in the middle, selectively resurfacing. If it looks bad, we do it. If it looks fine, we leave it alone. So I'm going to add a couple things to what uh, Dr. Crothers and Jackson said. So uh, like they said, there's some guys in the world that do every single patella, some that do not. The three of us are all selective resurfacers. What we mean by that depends how much wear there is, how much cartilage is left behind the patella. Uh, here's what I'm going to add to this. The, what the robot has really done is uh, made our patella tracking perfect. Uh, the way we used to do total knee replacements, as we said, they were cookie cutter knees. Everyone got the same knee in the same alignment, and not everyone's knee is in the same rotation. So what was happening is the patella were dislocating. They were coming out of place. We don't see that anymore. When we get these x-rays postoperatively, that patella sits exactly where it needs to sit because we got a rotation on our thigh component, the femoral component, right where it needs to be for you. And it's amazing to see uh, how that patella just sticks like glue right to the front of that knee. And I'm sure these guys can tell you the same thing. So that's what it, the robot really makes a difference in the patella. Let me throw out another question here from the chat. Uh, does flexion usually continue to improve even after six to eight weeks of recovery? The answer is yes. Um, you know, most of our patients are coming in with near complete um, flexion at, you know, even at the two week mark, I've had several come in with over a hundred, uh, degrees of flexion. Um, but you know, it, they continue to get better and better and better by, I tell my folks by about a year, it is what it is. And that's about what you're going to get. Um, you know, but very, very, uh, very good question. When is Melanie should consider a, a manipulation? Uh, six weeks. And what he's talking about is when the knee is, um, Postoperatively, it doesn't have a lot of bend, and sometimes we have to go to the operating room and and put you to sleep and bend the knee to break up scar tissue. Um, in my hands, it's a very rare occurrence. I think I've done one in two years, um, so it's but it's been uh, it's uh, six weeks is the time when you do that. So this is the latest. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm a little bit more aggressive. I would say ten weeks. I think would probably be as late as I would do it. I agree. Doctor, as ten is the latest I would. Um, so here's a couple more questions, and this will go with what's on the screen. There was a question of um, who can I, uh, who's doing Mako robots, um, and how do I get a hold of them? Uh, this is our contact information. Um, we're the guys doing the robots. Uh, 
here in town. We're the fellowship trained guys doing the robots here in town. Um, so you can certainly call our number and ask for us. Um, there was a question about after balancing, why does it not change and how is it maintained during surgery? Um, basically, I think the question is alluding to why would we balance and then cut the bone and it be and it not not change there. Um, the answer is is we're we're resecting the amount of bone and replacing it with the metal implant. We're only resecting um, as much as the total compartments uh, of what we're putting back in. So the uh, the implants themselves are with the metal, plastic, and metal is around 18 millimeters, and our native knee has about a millimeter of play in built into it without having any surgery done at all. So um, that's the reason why it really doesn't change after we balance it because we're just resecting and with precision and accuracy, um, you know, the, the cutting the amount of bone that we're replacing with the implant. Let me see. Let's see, let's see other ones we have on. There's a one about an insurance. Um, I, don't, I don't know that any of us really know exactly most insurance cover it. The one insurance we're having trouble with is Aetna and not really trouble. They're the hardest one to get the, the CT approved for. So all the other insurances, I haven't run into another issue, but I can't specifically say uh, this person's insurance or any of, the, uh, any of the other ones. I think it's been pretty rare for the most part to have any issues with as far as insurance. And we actually have uh, a patient um, wrote in that said their insurance was initially denied and with OSS and with the, the staff and team that we have, her, her surgery got approved. So that's, we do work hard to get these approved because we believe in the, the technology. Um, I guess we got a couple of how these surgeries being handled during the pandemic. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the big things that patients wanna know about and make sure that they're, they're safe. All of our patients here at OSS Hospital um, get COVID tested and they're COVID tested about 72 hours prior um, so we don't have any COVID patients here. This is all orthopedic hospital. Um, everybody gets screened. Um, we did put some additional restrictions in where we are uh, decreasing uh, whether there are actually no visitors allowed while you're here at, up in as an inpatient on the floor. Um, that's really the, the big restriction that we put in place that's different than normal, but um, certainly we do everything in our power to protect all our patients um, with COVID. Another question was, is what is the number of uh, total replacements were that uh, we've done at OSS. I mean, I don't know, if, does anyone have a true number? Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, I think uh, probably over a thousand years is what Dr. Marquette said. So um, and how many actual robotic systems we've done, I mean, that's, uh, that's a little bit tougher to say. I mean, I think all of us are doing, you know, over, over 200 new replacements a year, um, probably about some of us more than others, but yeah, we do do a lot of these. Um, the question is glue ever used? Um, but I, I guess that that answer could be referring to a couple things. Uh, I guess number one, it would be if you're talking about the, um, the skin closure. Um, yeah, some of us use uh, subcuticular sutures and, and use a skin glue on the top. Um, some of us do use skin staples. Um, that's just a kind of surgeon preference. Um, and then the other way that that question could be taken is whether how we put these implants into place. Um, there's two different ways to do that to get the, uh, the implants attached to the bone. One is, uh, is actually a bone cement, which people will say glue sometimes. Um, so yeah, the answer to that is some of us will, will use bone cement to put the implants and hold the implants in place. And some of us will do what's called a cementless implant, basically where you press fit the bone uh, excuse me, press fit the implant over the bone and have the bone grow into it over time. Um, and some of us do that for, for certain reasons. And, you know, who's, who's a candidate for that just kind of depends on, on the individual. So I'll answer another one. Um, a question came in and said, what uh, tendons are on the anterior surface and are they replaced? I'm thinking you're referring to the patellar tendon and the quadriceps tendon. Um, we have to make an arthrotomy, which basically cuts around the kneecap open the space up to put the parts in. Um, they're not replaced, but we repair everything um, with sutures and over time that heals back. The only other way that may be taken is, is the tendons in the middle part of the knee, which are your ACL and your PCL. Every knee replacement, uh, every total knee replacement has the ACL removed. 
for all of us, we basically maintain the PCL, um, which allows uh, in, in the literature and in theory, allows the knee to have better proprioception, meaning the brain knows where the knee is in space. Um, and then another question I'll throw out to Jor, Dr. Margetis. Uh, do you require general anesthesia for the procedure? Do you re recommend peripheral blocks, adductor canal, and IPAC block? Very good question. Oh, very good question. Uh, we all prefer uh, to do spinal anesthesia. Um, we try to avoid general anesthesia as best possible. However, there are contraindications to spinal anesthesia, one of which would be prior spine surgery at times. But we are able to do spinal anesthesia even in patients that have had prior spine surgery. And all of us here do uh, peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, we do adductor canal blocks if the anatomy allows. Otherwise, we do femoral nerve blocks as well. Uh, so our patients get three different things. Uh, one, spinal anesthesia. Two, a peripheral nerve block. And then an intraoperative, what we call cocktail, which is a pain um, injection throughout the knee to help with postoperative pain control. Uh, another question I see here, are you the only three from OSS doing MAKO? Uh, there are four of us doing uh, MAKO robotic knee replacement here at uh, OSS. It's the three of us and Dr. King. Uh, we're the only three uh, fellowship trained joint replacement surgeons doing the makeup, but there are four of us at OSS. All right, we got any others? Um, and we are the only ones in town doing the uh, makeup robotic knee replacement. Correct. Only Correct. groups. Correct. All right. Well, we'll any go. other last questions? Yeah, those are some great questions, guys. Very, uh, very informed. Some in chat. Okay, we'll look at chat. This is a question of how many of you have done. Um, we can all speak to it. Um, or how, kind of describe your experience with it. Um, so the question is how many I've done. Uh, gosh, I gotta look back. Like I said, I think um, all of us here are are basically doing the majority of our surgeries as hip and knee replacements. I, you know, I'd say me, I think uh, probably uh, 200 knee replacements a year is probably about what I'm doing. Um, or get us. Um, I guess I, got to, I spoke about it before. Robotics, I just switched to two years ago. So I've been doing robotics now for about two years before I was doing conventional. I, at this point, I'm doing probably around a little over 300 uh, knee replacements a year and probably another 100 plus hip replacements is where I'm at. And I'm similar to Dr. Crothers. I, you know, about 200 um, knee replacements a year. Again, I did this in my training three years ago as well, where we did over uh, 500 um, total joints. Uh, we weren't using as much hip in my training. Um, so I'd say probably another 250 um, knee replacements. So let's go here. Uh, how long after surgery will you be able to drive is a question. Uh, really it depends on what side, right or left. I tell folks use common sense. Um, an easy, you know, just algorithm is three to four weeks if it's your left knee, uh, between four and five if it's your right knee. Um, but really, it's, it depends on each individual patient. I've had people uh, recover uh, so quick that I can't tell them they can't drive in two weeks. So it just depends on each individual. I don't know if you guys are the same or not. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my answer to this is... Um there's really no guidelines. It's when you're not taking narcotics and, and when you feel safe, um, certainly your right leg is your driving leg. It's going to take a little bit longer. Um, you know, the right leg is usually you can tell patients about, you know, three or four weeks or so, the left leg, maybe a little bit earlier, but when you're not taking narcotics and when you're feeling safe, if you're not sure, go practice, don't hurt yourself and don't hurt anybody else. Great. So Corey, I'll ask this to you is, um, they asked, is hip uh, surgery similar? Is hip surgery similar? Yeah, so hip surgery does a little bit of the same things that um, knee replacement surgery does. Um, the big thing that I think that the, uh, the hip surgery um, helps with is, is implant positioning, right? Um, historically, a big problem with hip replacements has been dislocations. I think um, putting the cup in an appropriate position where you're gonna decrease the risk of dislocations is, is very important. Um, the robotic software also gives a lot of feedback to the surgeon about what the patient's leg length and offset are. Offset means how far the hip sets out to the side. So it helps give you more information to the surgeon to make sure we're lining up your leg lengths the best we can to help align the, uh, excuse me, help align the implants 
um, in the best position we could possibly put them. Um, so yeah, I think I think the hip is definitely helpful as well. And then, um, so another question is, uh, if you had a partial knee and then you're still having pain, can a Mako be done to improve it? Um, you want to answer that, George? Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, as uh, the guy said a little bit before, it depends why you're having pain. Uh, but regardless of whether the component has uh, become loose or you have developed arthritis in the other compartments uh, or there's instability, yes, we can utilize the robot uh, in order to revise or redo your knee and convert it to a total knee replacement. Uh, and by doing the robot, it's been amazing. I've, we've all done several of these already. And it's essentially made a revision surgery, like a primary knee replacement. It's almost like doing it from the first time. It's been amazing because we were able to conserve our bone cuts. We're able to get your knee back into the alignment it needs to be. So it's been a game changer for these revisions in our hands. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would agree too. And I, um, you know, we do a lot of revisions for instability and other purposes, whether you had a partial or a total, we've done total to total um, with the Mako as well. Uh, we'll go after another question here. Uh, what is the percentage of Mako replacements success after uh, recovering rehab compared to conventional uh, replacements? Um, so I, there's no real literature out yet um, based on comparing a side-to-side -side comparison. Um, there's not enough long-term data. What we're, we're seeing trends though. So I was just on the, the meeting with uh, hip and knee surgeons around the country. And from last year to this year, there's an increase from 18% to nearly 30% of surgeons who are primarily using Mako for their hips and knee replacements. And these are people who are fellowship trained joint specialists, and that's pretty predominantly all they do. Um, so we're certainly seeing a trend. In my hands, I think that uh, the recovery is certainly for the majority of patients quicker um, and less narcotic use and pain uh, is, is lower. Um, you know, we have been doing it here for around two years and the big benchmark is, is two year, five year and 10 year data. Um, at some point we were, we talked about pulling our data to, to kind of see where we're at with things. Um, but, you know, I think all of us would agree that uh, anecdotally, we do believe it is, uh, it, it's quicker recovery um, at least. So let's here, will the, will the knee look larger after knee surgery? Yeah, I mean, after any knee replacement, um, I, I do tell patients, your, your knee is never gonna get down to the size that your, your other knee, a non-operative knee is, but it, it shouldn't be much bigger. But anytime you have to cut into a knee, there's, there's gonna be scar tissue involved. Uh, the knee will be a little bit larger in diameter than the other side, but, but not appreciably. So another question is, Will other uh, ortho surgeons at OSS be trained to use Mako in the future? Um, that's a tough question. That's an, it's an individual preference. Um, the way we look at it is, is we see the value in it. Um, you know, the way I, I tell folks is, you know, my partners do a good job um, is, you know, if you get a roof, roof put on, you don't care how it's put on, whether it's with a hammer or a nail gun, it, it doesn't matter to the, to the consumer as long as it's done well. Um, and for us, um, I uh, equate the robot to a nail gun and, you know, it allows me to do uh, the best job possible for each uh, of my patients. Uh, so another one. How, how much blood is lost during a knee replacement? Um, very little. We use a tourniquet uh, on the top part of your thigh, which is elevated during surgery. Uh, and then we also use an agent where we inject into the knee to help post-operative uh, blood loss. So what it does, it causes some coagulation or clotting in the knee. Therefore, it doesn't continue to bleed. I will tell you in uh, the past five years, I've not transfused the knee replacement. So very, very little blood loss in a, in a knee replacement. Yeah, I think that's a question that I get a lot too, is how likely is a, a blood transfusion? And I say the same thing. I can't remember the last time I had to transfuse a patient after a replacement. So I think um, the trends when before the, the agent that Dr. Morgettis was talking about came about, uh, there's some trends that said it was around 30% transfusion rate. And that was kind of before our time. At our time with the advent of that agent, it's somewhere below 1% of blood transfusion. And that's nationwide. And we're um, on par with that, I would say here. Um, 
got anything else in chat? Is there any? I don't have anything else. I don't think I missed any school to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, I think I answered some of the questions that you guys asked when uh, people were talking. I'll just I'll answer them in front of everybody. Um, somebody asked how much time is saved using the robots. Uh, you know, that that's just uh, depends on the surgeon. Um, you know, some of us are a little bit more uh, faster than others. Um, uh, it's, it's not a matter of how much time is saved. It's, it's more a question of how you're putting these implants in and how you're managing the soft tissues. I think that's what's more important than, than time. But, you know, some of us do it faster than conventional knees and, and some less fast. But, you know, it, it's really the, the outcome that, that we're looking for that's most important. Um, Somebody else asked, will I be able to kneel after a knee replacement surgery? That's also a question I get a lot. Um, you know, the answer to that one is uh, everybody's different with this. Okay. Now there's no mechanical reason why you can't kneel afterwards, but some people will not like the sensation. If you do an incision over the anterior part of the knee, uh, you have to cut some of the skin nerves. Every person with a knee replacement will have a little bit of numbness on the lateral part of their knee. Some people just don't like the sensation, but there's no mechanical reason why you can't do it. So everybody's a little bit different with that one. Um, I think we answered the rest of those. Um, Thanks, so did, uh, did we answer this? How long is the actual procedure? Um, yeah, is this from our guest, you want to take that one? Well, it, it, it varies, as you said. How long does the procedure last? I mean, every surgeon is unique in terms of how long they take to do a procedure. Um, I will tell you that regardless of uh, how long it takes, as long as you're not a significant outlier taking two hours to do a knee replacement, you're pretty safe. Uh, and, then, and the robot ensures that there's plenty of checkpoints where you're doing a nice job and, and not uh, uh, straying from the plan. Um, so I would say on average, if you would look at a knee replacement at our facility, I, I would tell you on average it's an hour uh, procedure on average. When you take the fastest surgeons that we have and the, some of the slower guys, on average, robotic and, transit and uh, conventional, it's probably around an hour per procedure. Got anything else? Uh, I still got 46 people here. Uh, <laughs> you guys got anything else? Yeah. Let us know. You want to unmute them one at a time if they're for us? Unmute them just after. So, yeah, we can try to unmute everyone if you guys want to you know, fire some questions at us without having to type. Certainly happy to do that. Hands. Oh, okay, so we see some hands raised. We're going to address each one of them now. We're going to go to that next. We'll unmute your microphone as we see a hand raised. Participants. They might be individually muted. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, when they muted themselves. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, so just tell them we're going to probably do another one next month, maybe. Yeah, so that sounds good. Yeah, um, you know, we're going to, we'll try to keep doing these um, you know, in the future. Maybe next month we'll do another, um, add some new stuff to it. Um, we'll try to bring you the, you know, the latest and greatest and, and the new stuff that we're doing. Um, you know, certainly, um, guys, if you have any further questions, you know, we're all here. Um, you know, we're all working in different offices. You know, myself, I'm, I'm here at Powder Mill. We all have uh, clinic, clinic time here at Powder Mill. Um, you know, I go to Mechanicsburg. Dr. Uh, Dr. Jackson's up in, in Hanover as well. Um, you know, he's also at the West York office. And, and Dr. Margettis is, is here at Powder Mill and also at our, at our West York office. So... You know, if you have questions about anything, if you want to come see us, I was checking your knee, knee hip out. We're certainly happy to do that. Um, and we've got the phone number for you up here on the screen, you know, 848 Um, Just call up and, and ask, to, ask to see us and certainly be happy to get you in. Um, I don't see anything else here in the uh, in the chat. So, hey, here's one. Did you talk about this? What is the difference? So the question is, what is the link between osteoarthritis and a Baker cyst? Does the total uh, knee replacement correct this problem? So 
Um, just briefly answer this, like uh, Dr. Crowther said, osteoarthritis is wear and tear of the cartilage and then you get pain, inflammation, swelling. The inflammation and swelling is fluid. The fluid, uh, the Baker's cyst is an outpouching of the fluid uh, caused by uh, joint replacement. Now we don't actually chase down the Baker's cyst, but by removing the arthritis and removing the, the part that causes the swelling, the Baker's cyst um, decompress. That's a, a pretty common question as well. Yeah, you take care of the problem and the cyst tends to go away. We do decompress that during surgery. All right, guys. Well, I think uh, that's all we got. Thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, like I said, certainly we're happy to answer any other questions you have. Come on in and see us. Uh, but thanks for tuning in. And thanks for bearing with us with the uh, some of the technical difficulties. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, have a good night. See ya, We're going to sign off.